So our first, se first session on Big Talk from Small Libraries today is on accreditation grants and a seed library all in one year. Uh, this is a session that is, uh, I'm very excited to hear. It's one that's close to my heart. Um, this is a library here in Nebraska, Maltman Memorial Library in Wood River, and they just became accredited for the, uh, re uh, received their public library accreditation for the very first time this year. So congratulations, Mandy and Deb. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, awesome. Thank you very and, much. Um, I encourage them strongly to come on uh, Big Talk and share with you guys how they did it. So we have here Deborah Fairbanks is the director at the library, and Mandy Kupersky is her, uh, the library assistant there at the Mall Memorial Library in Wood River. So I'm just going to hand it over to you guys to tell us all about what you've been doing for the last year. All right. Thank you, Krista. Good morning, everyone. We're going to tell you a little bit about our library to begin with. It's a one-story building, originally built in 1964 by William Ward Maltman. He donated the money in memory of his wife, Rose, who loved books. And in 1979, we added an addition on here of 20 by 24 foot with the Merle Wynn Freeman Estate money. Totally, we got 1,980 square foot total. We're looking for our future to add on to this because we've absolutely, in the last seven years I've been here, filled wall-to-wall -wall space. And there's a picture of the Freeman room. We use that room just for the children's room and that's where we run our programs right now. When I came here seven years ago, there was two chairs, a table, the newspapers and magazines and an open room. So you can see where we've expanded to. That's kind of the front area, it's well, one side of it. That's where our book club meets and our Jigsaw January puzzles on the table there yep. and kind of a meeting group area around the newspapers and magazines. Um, basically to get a credit, there were some steps that we had to take. First thing is at least one library staff has to take 13 classes online to be certified. We both took the 13 classes. Um, the library board has to have 20 continuing education hours. The and that's the whole library board had to take it. And that's they just came in, they took webinars together, and that's how they achieved theirs. And then we did a technology plan. The library staff here did that helped us with points more than anything. And then between the library staff and the library board, we got together and we did our community needs response plan, our policies, and our mission statement. And that helped to get us accredited, which we did within a year, which usually takes three years. We kind of, you know, pushed through it. We took one class basically after the other because once we got started on them, we realized how much they really helped us yep. with these plans and with our policies and, and that we really need them. In fact, we actually took some extra classes instead of just the 13 because we found them very helpful to us. Yes. And then there's the whole thing of staying accredited and for every three years to stay accredited, accredited, the staff members that are accredited have to have 45 hours of continuing education and that's every three years. So if you figure 15 hours a year, it's really not that bad. And then the library board has to have 20 hours as a whole like they did before, which, you know, web. And it's the same places that everybody can get theirs. You can do your webinars, your workshops, and go to conferences. And the board can go to the conferences, too, if they want to see what it's all about. Um, then it, you need to review your plans and policies. We have it so that we do it every year. That way, it kind of helps with your points that you get when you do your bibliostat every year. And with us, we managed to get by on our first year. We're actually at the silver level. So we were pretty proud of that. Krista, is there anything else that we're missing for accreditation? Um, um, let me see. Um, no, that's actually pretty good. Yeah. Um, excuse me. All right. Next, we'll move on to grants. You wanna... We received several grants this year. We got um, the Youth Grant for Excellence and we went for STEAM. So we got uh, Legos purchased to start a Lego club. 
I'm sorry. I it's follow. okay. That's okay. <laughs> I was reading my paper. We just kind of, yeah, we have local foundations. It's a good place to look for your grants. Um, we have actually a community foundation. And what they do is they take the money that, and they have it categorized into the different areas of the city. They have one for the schools. They have one for the library. They have one for the parks departments and, you know, different areas of town. And they have so much money set in our account and they hold the money for us. And then we apply for a grant. And with that money, we've actually gotten six laptop computers over the last seven years. And it's we have a picture here of our computer area. You know, like we've said before, we're really tight on space. So and all of our computers are laptops, which are cabled to the tables, which make it. Easy. Yeah, it's easier. And, you know, we just don't have the space to put any you know, desktop PCs up. Um, Mandy and Deb, I just want to jump yeah. in here a second. Um, since we did just talk about it, we did have a couple of questions about accreditation. So I was going to answer for that. Okay. Um, we, um, here in Nebraska, we do public library um, accreditation and public librarian certification. So the staff becomes certified. Um, they do, they, they have up to three years to do, within a three year time period, they have to do 40, as they mentioned, 45 hours of uh, continuing education um, to the librarians to be certified. And then boards over that same period of time as a whole um, do 20 hours. And then um, if they do that and then enter, um, submit an online form. Um, they also have to uh, start out with submitting their public annual public library survey. Um, those statistics that um, many of you may be familiar with across the country, everyone does that, um, hopefully. Um, and that is information is all fed into an application form where they can then share some more information with us about they do things that aren't and maybe on the survey. Um, when um, and then as someone did ask also about the silver accreditation um, here in Nebraska, there are three levels of accreditation, uh, bronze, silver and gold. And the more um, you can earn points to get to each level. So depending on what kind, how much um, based on you know, some of the funding that you get, um, services you provide, um, uh, continuing education, things your staff might pr uh, um, participate in. Um, so the advocacy, all sorts of different things, you can earn different points and you can be either bronze um, with the lowest number of points, silver middle, and then gold, the highest one. Um, if you are an accredited library here in Nebraska, you do receive um, a state aid funding um, and it is, uh, you'll get a little bit more depending if you're a higher level. Um, so gold, silver, and bronze. Um, also, uh, you are eligible then once you become accredited to apply for grants. So a lot of it has to do with the money. Uh, you can, um, I did that. you can, um, here at the Library Commission, the, uh, the Youth Grant, the Youth Grant for Excellence that they mentioned, um, any of our grants you need to be accredited for. And there are some other grants with some organizations we work with too that, um, in order to apply for, you do need to be accredited. So, um, it uh, gets you some more funding from us. It gets you the ability to apply for grants for things. And that was one of the things Wood River actually, we kind of fast tracked them on their accreditation last year since they were doing so good with all of their uh, continuing education and they wanted to apply for the Youth Grant for Excellence. Um, and that was coming up. So we made sure we helped them get um, all of that done so that they could then apply for the, the grant that they wanted through, through uh, the Library Commission. Um, so this is how we do it in Nebraska. I know other states do have, some states do have accreditation programs and they may work differently in your area, um, but that's how we do it here um, in, um, in Nebraska. All right. so yeah, um, and then someone does have a question, and this now this I'll put this question out to you guys for your library. But I will say the question is: Is the board appointed or elected? Your library board. Our board was appointed by the mayor and city council. The names of people that wanted to be on it were submitted, and they chose from them. Uh, yeah. Okay, they like volunteered, and then were chosen by the board. Yes, right? yes. Otherwise, you'd yep. have to have an election, and we feared <clears throat> the cost of putting an election to elect people into it was not necessary. Uh, yeah. And, and we so, have five on our board. Five people, right. Five people is a minimum you need to have. Yeah. Um, we have a uh, certain state statutes here in Nebraska that um, 
dictate how libraries work, um, public libraries can work, and they can either be appointed or elected. The library boards is going to depend, as you guys said, from town to town, how they choose to do it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I think that's everything about the accreditation and certification. Yeah. All right. Yeah, it's also bragging rights. You get to brag. You, know, you get a sender, you get a sender, well, <laughs> <laughs> um, Oh, we do enough of that. Yeah. yeah. So there um, is that as well. Yes. All right. All right. Um, and we did get the Youth Grant for Excellence, like you said, this year. And we got, because we need to be accredited to be able to receive this. And it was wonderful because these children are definitely enjoying the Lego room. <laughs> they are and that's through the library commission or your local library commission sometimes they have grants we've gotten continuing education grants and we've gotten like she said the youth grants for a youth grant for excellence so that's just some other options that's actually the lego room that we got built it used to be a little old storage room and we cleaned it out and moved everything to a building across the street that we were storing and now we use that for our Lego room. Um, Dollar General, they actually have a lot of really good literacy grants that they have that they give out every year. You kind of got to catch them in their window. Um, they have an adult literacy grant, a summer reading grant, a family literacy grant and youth literacy grants. And we have actually used them for our summer reading grants every year. Well, starting last year and we've tried again this year. We'll know in May whether or not we got it. but. Um, they have a cap on it. All you got to do is go online to Dollar General Literacy Foundation and they will actually um, on there, they'll, you know, you can go to the grants and it says what the criteria is for each one of the grants and, you know, all your dates and stuff that you need. They're fairly simple applications to fill out, you know, for a grant application. So um, another grant that we've gotten was from the National Network of Libraries and Medicine. We got um, a grant of was it twenty five hundred dollars? Yes, twenty five hundred dollars that we use for our after school program kids. The after school program with the school comes over, and they send twenty five kids every week on one day during the week, and we do activities with them here at the library. And since we got this grant, we've actually been doing a lot of physical activity stuff with them. We've gotten balls, basketball hoops, all sorts of sports equipment that we can actually use. And it's not something that we'll just use for this. It's something we'll use more in the future, too. So it was a really good deal to get it. Um, ideas that they've actually recommended for their grants that they have is a health and wellness grants, um, after school programs like we used them for. You could do family programs if you want to. You could have like a family fun night. You could, you know, have families come over and play games. If we're lucky, we got a park right behind us. So we can do a lot of outdoor activities if we want you to for our library. And we actually have a picture of this ginormous basketball hoop that we got. And we got back here in our little room. And <laughs> it, it stays here because it won't fit out the door. No, we put so. it together and then we couldn't get it out the front door to store it but, for when we need it. So we decided it had to stay. But it does fold up. It folds up to put away so we don't have the kids, you know, rooting around in it all the time. And we always have kids asking if they can have the basketball hoop down or something. It just gives them... One more activity that they can do in the winter time when it's cold out, they can come to the library and they can do something fun here. So, and that grant was we we were one of four in the nation to receive that, so we we're pretty proud of that one. All right, another place you can look is you can actually look at your local companies. Um, we have Southern Power here, Subway, Pizza Hut, and Casey's. We've actually used three of these already. Um, our Southern Power, that is where we get our power from around here. The rural places do, and then our city gets their power from here. Um, we put in a grant with them to get new lights because we have got these dark, dingy fluorescent lights that when you turn them on, they hum because the balances are going out. And we've had a lot of people complaining because it's really hard to see when it's cloudy out in here. So we put in for a grant to get all new, instead of just the, instead of replacing the whole fixtures, we looked into LED lights and we upgraded to LED lights and then just had an electrician come in and remove the balances from our light fixtures and direct wire these in. Yeah. So we go ahead and 
we got the grant for that. And then the grant came up just a little bit short, but they even had for switching over to LED lights, you would get a rebate back for each light bulb that you replace to an LED light. So not only that, we got that plus a rebate. They ended up actually paying for our lights and we came out $20 ahead. So, you know, they helped us out really good there. Subway, we've used Subway actually for, we've had gingerbread contests and we've had Subway donate gift cards for the winners, which has always been a real fun, fun family thing to do every Christmas. People really enjoy, they sit down with their kids and they make gingerbread houses and then they can show them off in the library. And we have Subway, they donate stuff for our summer reading program. They've helped us with, we got free kids meals that all the kids that were in the summer reading program got a kids meal um we've used pizza hut <clears throat> they actually are the ones that did the gingerbread contest for this year last year we had subway this year we had pizza hut they gave away two large pizzas for eat the winner of each category for the gingerbread house contest and then we get a personal pan pizza for each kid that does the summer reading program from them also so and we've looked into casey's because you know we've been talking about additions so we've been looking into more local places and Casey's has a really good you know it's you know they ask for more donations you just gotta fill out a form wait a couple of months and they'll let you know whether or not so we're kind of keeping them in mind for when we get ready to do our addition to our building and that's all we have for grants I guess Krista do you have any questions uh, let's see. Does anybody have any questions? Um, oh, uh, somebody does just just ask. What about what is? I guess the National Network of Medical Libraries. Um, well, actually, I guess why don't we know more about that one? Um, we actually. How was that one? How they came out in the newsletter? Okay. It was in the newsletter. I mean, it's one that they have a website. You can look on it and they have more information about their grants. And, you know, they even have all the grants they have filled out. They do have that you got to become a member. It's just you go online and you fill out, you know, some information about your library and stuff. And then that's, you know, <laughs> they want you to sign up for it. It just puts your name on it. There's no cost yeah, to become a member. This, this is from the National Library of Medicine. The, the yeah. um, it's through the U.S. government. So it's a National Network of Libraries of Medicine. Um, and their website is kind of, it's like their acronym, nnlm.gov. But you can just Google National Network of Libraries of Medicine and you'll find it. Um, they have regions that they... Um, multiple states that each of the there there are regional organizations so um for your state they'll they may cover like five or six different um states in addition to yours and they have people who are in charge of doing training and grants and things um through them for example here in nebraska we're part of the mid-continental region which covers um nebraska colorado kansas uh, iowa wait not iowa yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and they have the different continents and stuff. I think you can type in your zip code if I remember right and it'll pop it up when you go to sign up for it. To tell you where you are. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's pretty it's a pretty easy website to navigate around. They do a lot of good work there, yeah. They do. Um, and the only thing with that grant is because we were going to do like power bars and stuff like that and some granola bars for the kids and some bottled water and stuff, sure. but that grant does not cover any food or drink. Ah, okay. So that is a little stipulation that we did not know about. So we had to have some board members come in and we had a bunch of people that don't like spending money trying to figure out how to spend a thousand dollars. It was a really tedious day. But yeah, it's you know there's something some of those you might need to call and ask about the stipulations on them because mm -hmm. there's some things they won't cover. But they so. but they had some really good things that we got for the program. We got those little like scooters that the kids sit on. So we got the the ball pit balls so we can play like the happy hippo game with the kids. Um, 
we got soccer sets and like playground balls, the cornhole game, a large parachute. Got a great big Connect Four set, like a four foot by four foot yeah, one. Yeah, it's huge. Uh, like the basketball <laughs> game that we had, footballs, uh, base plates to play the games with, some jump ropes, and we taught health and nutrition uh -huh. with uh, soul foods. foods. Yeah. So it was very good for, especially where we have a lot of winter this year and things were indoors, but there was a lot of those projects we could still use indoors. And some of them we go to and we play the Happy Hippo game. We actually use the elementary school gym because we're partnered with the elementary school for the after school program. So we can go there when we use it for the Happy Hippo game in the gym. And they do really like if you partner with a school. Mm -hmm. That was one of the one of the things, you know, if you're working with a school, that really, it helps it out a whole lot. And we use that to our advantage, so. Right. Now, since we're still on the topic of grants, we do have a couple of related questions. Um, people right. are wondering if you had any grant writing experience before doing this. I no. did not, no. <laughs> I did, I do have a lady that I know though, and she's, offered help if we ever get stuck she will come and help us and i know she said there's classes that you can take online that are free that will help you learn how to write grants um i don't really know what the online website was but i know she said they're always out there so but it's really not a one person job let me tell you we we work together on them because we can throw ideas back and forth of what we can think to put in those spaces and some of the things that we come up with and you also have to realize that you have to report afterwards. Some yes. of them, it's just one time that you have to report back to them by a certain date. And then some of them, it's like the one for the National Network of Libraries of Medicine. Um, yeah, it was four, four times. times. We yeah, had to we had to report back, you know, four different times. And they had dates that you had to report back by. So... And to tell them what you were doing. We submitted pictures of what we were doing. We had to take pictures of everything that we purchased. Of course, you have to keep all your receipts, um, you know, all that. And, and they want to know if you're really using the program and, and what kind of benefits you got from it. Yeah. And you want to make sure to do a really good follow-up so that, like, if it's one that you use, you know, try to put in for again, you want to do a really good follow-up so that you got a better chance of getting the grant again the next time. Kind of like with Dollar General, we try to use them for our summer reading program. We planned on using them again this year, so we made sure to do a really good report last year to hopefully improve our chances this year of getting help. Uh -huh. Yep. And every, and every grant you write definitely has follow-up. So remember that as you're doing the program to write down things that you did that were really yeah. important or how they went. If they went good, they want to know if you did fulfill what you were going to do or if you did not do, a, you know, it didn't turn out the way you thought it would turn out. So you might want to just take some notes as you go through and highlight. So when you have to fill out these forms, because sometimes they're like every two to three months, you have to fill one out for almost a year. All right, go ahead. Okay. All right. Ne Next thing we have is our seed library. This is my favorite thing to talk about. <laughs> um, we went to the um, conference here a couple years ago when they actually were talking about seed libraries. And I am in charge of our community garden here in town, so this kind of got me excited. Um, basically, you got to start the seed library. I had to do a lot of research. And we had to figure out some things about our library because we didn't have a space for this before. So we had to figure out where we're going to put our seeds. Um, and that was a big issue because we had, you know, we don't have much room. So we had these old card boxes. Card catalog, yes. Yeah, we had the card catalog boxes, first of all. Yes. And somebody keeps her crafting supplies in the card catalog. So finally, we got, <laughs> we got enough seeds that we moved up to. I took over the card catalog. <laughs> And that's what we keep our seeds in. That's actually the best way to store them. But, I mean, you could use a box or anything, depending on how many seeds you want to get. Last year, we probably had maybe two to 250, 250 to seed for seed packets. And, you know, that was just kind of start off because we were going off, you know, seeds that everybody donated and stuff. And started working with the community library or the community garden. <clears throat> 
to get more seeds. So we went ahead and we went from that to this year, we have 700 seed packets last time I counted. Um, the other thing is you gotta figure out how you're gonna count your seeds. Some libraries actually that do have seed libraries, I've heard where they scan them in and out through their scan system, they put a barcode on them. We don't do that. We just, I count the seeds at the beginning of the year and then, you know, we count them at the end and however many the difference is, that's how many seeds we have actually checked out. Um, some of them will limit the seeds that each person can take. We don't here because it's a small community and somebody keeps bringing in a lot of seeds. There's from the community garden and then we have another older gentleman that he gardens and he's brought in jars full of seeds for us. So and another thing is you got to figure out what you have for a budget as far as how much you want to spend on getting it started. Um, like I said, most of ours were donation. The only expense that we had in it was the packaging supplies. Other than that, the seeds, oh, no, sorry. The seeds for the first year were pretty much free for the library. So um, different ways that you can get your seeds is you can buy them on sale at the end of the growing season. I have made trips to Dollar General here this last year and I got packages of seeds for probably 10 cents a piece. Um, I've gotten a lot of them on sale that way. Donations, we've had people donate seeds. In fact, I had a lady the other day that brought in a whole variety of tomato seeds that she had ordered. Um, and then working with your community garden, like I said, we actually have an area in our community garden where we get all the seed, we have stuff so it doesn't cross pollinate so that, you know, we can plant stuff to use for seeds so we don't have to worry about it because that's something else you got to keep in mind when you're getting seeds that are donated is you got the cross pollination issue where, you know, something, some things can cross pollinate, some things can't. If somebody brings in a pumpkin that was sitting next to a gourd, you could get a really funny looking pumpkin the next year and that's not what they were expecting. So it's something that people need to look into. We have um, educational material, we have reading material and I can help them online or I can help people if they want to decide if they want to donate seeds to make sure that the ones that they're donating when people do come into the seed library they get what they're expecting to get. So it's kind of a learning thing it's you got to do a lot of looking online the farm, farm uh, sorry the farmer's almanac has got a lot of information that you could use for it and so does some of the other growing websites like gurney seeds you can go on their website and they'll actually help you out. And if you have any questions, you can actually call them and they will let you know what you, you know, what you can plant where and, you know, other information that you might need for either getting seeds or growing stuff. And it's really good to have that information to teach people because a lot of the people that we have come in here for the seeds, we have quite a few of them that they're just learning how to garden. So, you know, they need to, they're still trying to figure out how to do it. And it's, you know, not quite as simple as they think it is. Oh, I clicked on the wrong thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, packaging seeds, we've looked into, you can buy a seed packets, you can get all these little envelopes and they cost quite a bit as far as I'm concerned. And my printer does not have the setting to take little bitty envelopes and print them off. And I'm not gonna write on each envelope you know, all the information that I do, which on our envelopes, we put on the type of seed that they are, how many days it is to harvest, the where they're full sun, partial sun, shade, um, whether they're a vegetable, a squash, an ornamental, because there are some things that people will, um, <laughs> they think that it's, you know, you got yellow squash and then you have a crookneck squash. Well, a yellow squash is one that you can eat and then a crookneck squash is more of an ornamental gourd. So we label it that way so that people have more of an idea of what they're getting. And then we have the date that the seeds expire. And the way that we figure that is I go online and I look up the shelf life for the seeds. And then as every time we get a new one, I have a little Excel program on my computer that has each kind of seed and how long they're good. And then we just put the date that they expire. Then every year when I go through them, if it hits the expiration year, then you can take them out. You can either donate them to 
the 4-H or the FFA kids and they could go ahead and they could experiment with the seeds if they wanted to or if anybody wants them or you can just go ahead and pitch them. Um, the way that we make our seed packets is I actually use the little envelopes that you get at Dollar General or Dollar Tree and we get the self-adhesive self ones and what we do is we print them off our computers the three and five eighths by six and a half inch envelopes and I just make the what the seed packet is going to look like. I do a seed packet on each side. And then you cut the envelope in half and then you tape the side up where you cut it. And then you got your seed packets. It's a lot cheaper than buying them and they look oh, pretty professional, I think. So. And they fit in the card catalog really nice. They do fit in the card catalog really nice. They really so do. usually they're on their side, but they still fit. I guess, is there any questions, Krista, or? Uh, let's see, um, uh, um, excuse me. Somebody wants to know where you get your packaging supplies. Dollar General. Dollar General, right, you mentioned. <laughs> Scotch tape <laughs> and envelopes. Yep, that's, that's all we do is we just use the regular envelopes. I print, you know, I basically put on the computer, I use, um, oh, now I can't remember what it's called. It's through Microsoft. <laughs> I have a Microsoft, you know, you get on Microsoft. I think Word has it too, where you're going to do an envelope, like you're just going to type pre-addressed envelopes. Oh, right, right, yes. <laughs> yeah, and I just get the pictures and I slap it on. I basically make a seed packet on either side of the envelope, and then I just cut the envelopes in half and tape shut the open end. And like I said, the self-adhesive ones work better because then you have a straight top and it's glued for you. Uh -huh. The other ones with the, you know, they have that V on them and that just doesn't work very good. Ah, good tips. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this year we're doing a little bit differently that we left all the seed packets set out for people to look through. Last but, year we did. Well, last year, yes. And this year we're going to like print off pictures and put them in a notebook so they can select from the notebook. We'll go in the back room and pull what they want. So we don't get mixed up that way or misplaced when people stick them in where perhaps we already had them sorted. And we've had a problem with kids come in mm -hmm. and they'll take a whole bunch of seeds. They'll walk by. They just, you know. yeah, we had some kids that they just, they walked by and they just grabbed a bunch. They didn't look through them or anything. They just grabbed a whole bunch of them. So we kind of had to put a stop to it. Yeah. It's one of those things that you learn the hard way, what you can and can't leave out for, you know. <laughs> Right. Um, somebody who does want to know how many seeds, about how many seeds do you put in each envelope? Okay, like for pumpkin seeds, squash seeds, I usually put about six. That's enough to make two hills because I put about three, usually put three in a hill. Um, because if you're thinking about some of the people are going to have smaller gardens, if they want more seeds, they can come get more packets. Um, some of the smaller ones, like, well, tomato seeds, I also do about six because, you know, one tomato plant will make quite a few. But when you get to the smaller ones, I just kind of guess because with lettuce and celery and carrots, you really can't count those. So, yeah, I just kind of guess about how many you would want in them. It's kind of you got to know, you know, how serious your gardeners are and what they're going to want in there. So and it makes it if you do it. So, you know, it stretches it a little bit further sometimes because like with those little packages that you get at the store. How many people buy those and they only use a couple seeds out of them and then they store them in their garage? Well, if you store them in your garage and they get froze and they get hot, they don't work. So I will take those packets and I will make a, you know, two or three seed packets out of it because that way you don't have all those leftovers that get ruined. Yeah. Um, and someone wants to know, do you have any issues with people hoarding the seeds? No. No, not really. No. They're all very good about even if they open the back and that uh, they will share with us what they didn't need. Yeah. They'll bring it into us now. They yeah. know that we'll take it and repackage it for others. Right. Yeah. Right. We have and some people that really, really like them, though. They get all excited over them. I don't know if they get them all planted, but, you know. <laughs> it's one of those things, like I said, it's no cost. Like, all of our pumpkin seeds, because um, we have... A lot of the seeds go to the community garden. We actually have, it's a whole block, and it's a community garden. And the produce from the community garden for the ground that doesn't get used, um, 
me and some volunteers go out and we plant stuff there. Last year, we actually gave away 250 to 300 pumpkins and gourds here in the library. And wow. yeah, and that's not, we had 60 pumpkins and gourds that we actually gutted here in the library. <laughs> So we had seeds for the seed library. So, I mean, it's one of those things where we get plenty of seeds. And like I said, I have another, there's an older gentleman. He's a really big time gardener and he brings stuff in by the bags full. So, yeah, the only, like, the only cost we really have is the packaging. So. Okay. So you don't have to actually, once you start this kind of a project, you don't have to really re um, spend money to replenish the seeds every year because the people using the program do. Correct? Yes. Because that was the question. You have to constantly yeah. be replenishing. The, the, so it's the physical use of the packaging is really what the budget needs to be thought about. Yeah. And I mean, if you don't have a lot of gardeners that are going to bring in seeds, that's where, you know, you could end up with quite a bit of an expense in seeds. And I bought a lot of, you know, when I got my seeds before, I always did a lot. You buy them on Amazon, you can get them in bulk, you can get them from gurneys. Um, you could probably try calling seed companies and get some donations of some seeds. Oh, yeah. So, in fact, some of the stuff that started this was actually, I had a, uh, we had a gentleman that worked at the local co-op and a lot of our seeds we got that first year was he gave me this little box that they have had that he's gotten from uh, seed companies or something had dropped it off and he goes, I ain't going to use them. So he gave them to me and they went to the, you know, seed library. So. Sure. sure. So somebody has actually, I think is a, a pretty, um, Obvious question that I didn't really think about when you started talking about this. Well, can you explain exactly how a seed library works? Uh, people aren't actually borrowing seeds. I mean, they have to, and then returning those same seeds. Yeah. They, um, <laughs> that is a really good question. <laughs> Basically, like I said, you can, the one library that when we learned about it, they checked it, they checked the seeds out and then they would go back through and they would just delete those but then they would keep a tally of them. They're not returning the seeds. Basically, it's more of a community service yeah. where you're packaging yeah. seeds for people to use. They can try new seeds and, or they can come and get their seeds there. Some of the people don't have the money if you go into town, you know, during the beginning of the season. Some of these packages of seeds are two to four dollars for a package of seeds. And, you know, that and with these, you're getting a lot more of the local grown seeds and stuff that is grown around here. And it's just, it's more or less a community service. You're not checking stuff out. And then, you know, basically it's free seeds. Right. And then when, and then the people who are using them, not every time, but if they can, they will then bring back the seeds from what they've grown. Yeah. Some people do. Some people don't. It's right. just a matter of whether or not they know how to do it. You know, we've right. gotten, we've also had seeds brought back to us in a baggie and they're moldy. So oh, yeah. it's kind of a learning, you know, it's a learning curve. So, but you do have to be careful as to what the seeds are that you get in. You have to make sure that, you know, when, because there's some seeds that you don't want brought in that people could bring in. So you kind of got to watch that too. Any other questions? Um, so one here. Um, do you now? I assume because of where we are geographically, the question is: Do they do you check these out all year, or is it just during like you know the growing seasons? We can check them out all year if somebody wants to grow anything indoors. But oh, mainly, people, yeah, mainly people start hitting us up about you know here pretty soon. We've had people back there looking, so yeah. It depends. Some people like to start stuff inside. Some people don't. So, right, right. Now we have, I've been adding flowers to it too. So yeah. that's something that people can be starting now indoors. Uh -huh. And it, it's a learning curve. I can grow vegetables and stuff just fine. Flowers, I'm still learning on. So <laughs> 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 we're 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 slowly getting it in there. <laughs> So you mentioned the other library that actually had barcodes and, and check them out and stuff. And you, you said you don't do that. But do you 
are you able to count this? So, but you do track as sort of like a circulation for, how do you keep track of that for statistics to see how it's going? Count packets. <laughs> You just keep counting, yeah. Okay. Yeah, like we had a whole bunch of, I just got done packaging a whole bunch of seeds, and what we did was we sat there and we counted all the seed packets, and then I'll count them again at the end of the year, or if I add more, then I'll have to, you know, count before I add, and, you know, so you know how many you got in between, so that's, <laughs> that's the easiest way I could come up with to do you know, to do it. And every time I go through them, we kind of take an inventory. If we have seeds that we're getting low on, I'll put them on the list. And then we kind of let people know that, hey, you know, we're running low on tomatoes. So uh -huh. if you want to donate some tomato seeds or anybody has tomatoes, tomato seeds, you know. Sure. It's pretty good guessing game, yeah. though. Yeah. And I have to wonder, I wonder, is this, and I, I should know this because as we collect these, is this included in your public library survey statistics in circulation somewhere? I didn't because I didn't get a count done until this year. Uh, okay. So hopefully we're planning on adding that because we actually added that and we have actually had people start, they really like Jigsaw January. They've started checking out puzzles too. Ah, yeah. So I need to add both of those and come up with some mm -hmm. kind of account for both of them. So. Sure. Work in progress. <laughs> Anything you quote unquote check out or circulate can be part of your statistics, yeah. Yeah, and that's, we're, we're gonna, but we gotta, like the puzzles I think we're gonna try to put in our computer system. So it's gonna be me taking a lot of pictures of puzzles so they can look at them online. Cause we don't have the storage over here. What we did was we took over the old city building <laughs> and it's kind of become our little storage locker and like our cake pans, we don't have room for those here. So we have all those in totes across the street. So they have to look online and they have pictures of each of the cake pans and then they pick out what they want. Then we go over and we get it. And the puzzles will be the same because we got a lot of puzzles. Sure. Um, and then we do have one more question that's about the uh, community garden. Um, I, I know you mentioned that you did bring some of the things to the library, but how generally is the produce from the community gar garden distributed to the community? I have got these. <laughs> um, they're little kid organizer totes so you can stack up. And I actually have a bunch of those that I bring them. I have one set that I can bring here and another set I can take to somewhere like the senior center. And as the garden produce gets picked, it gets brought in and put in those totes, and anybody that wants to come and get it can come and get it. Comes and picks it up, and they know where they, they know where to go to find where you go. Oh, yeah, and they know when the watermelons and stuff are done too. They got that figured out pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> but and then we have local gardeners. If they have a surplus of stuff, they bring it in too. Mm -hmm. So it's just growing from what it started out to be. Yeah. It's just one of those things that it's one more service that we provide for our community. Yep. All right, go ahead. Continue with your presentation. Well, I think that's if there's oh. anything else you want to add, Krista. I mean, <laughs> I'm a fast talker, apparently. Oh, you're great. You're doing great. Um, yeah. All right. Well, we did have a few other questions that were on here, so I think we'll since we have um, a bit of time here for your session. Okay. Um, uh, talking about the seed library, they wanna know if you have a garden club in your community. Um, we have the garden committee. They're the ones that, we are the ones that actually kind of help to make decisions and stuff. And we write the grants if we need anything added to it. Um, what we actually do is like this year we've had, we've had a peach tree donated and we had, was it two flats of peaches that were brought in this year? Yeah. Never so we actually got rid of two flats of peaches and those ones were so good. I wanted to add another tree. So we actually got a grant this year. It's, you know, back to the, you know, writing of grants and stuff. But yeah, we got a grant this year and now we got a tree that we found. It's got four different varieties of apples and it self pollinates because apple trees, usually you have to have two. And that whole group of people has helped to get the grant so we can get that tree and they'll plant that tree this spring. Wow, nice. nice. Yep, and then we try to get, you know, they're, we're trying to get the garden going. It kind of had a couple of rough years and here we're trying to get it back up on its feet, so. 
Um, where actually is the community garden? Is it on your property or is it just somewhere else in town? We have a gentleman that he owned a vacant lot that actually he still owns the property, but they have put water lines in and that's where our community garden's at now. Nice. It's just across the road a ways. It's not very yeah. far. It, literally, it's like three or four blocks from my house. So guess who gets to go check on it? <laughs> <laughs> it's a real good hobby. So. Uh, let's see. Uh, speaking about the produce, um, in the beginning, before word spread about where to get it, did you have any sort of trouble with um, any issue with excess produce too much and not what not sure what to do with it? We really haven't because mm -hmm. once we kind of started with the community garden, I brought up, I'm not a real big veggie eater, so I always told people if I plant this stuff, will you come eat it? So <laughs> we've had a lot of people that, oh yeah, we'll take whatever you plant, and we had was it a hundred pumpkins we gave away in one day probably i think so we uh, had i brought in a whole pickup load of pumpkins and we just lined the tops of our shelves and we had a movie day and the kids when they got done with their movie they all picked out pumpkins and took them home so and some of them picked out a few more and then you know the parents picked out some and it worked pretty good and this last year, our uh, patrons have grown to over 7,000 that we had this last year, which is a big growth in our library because of all the extra activities that we offer here. Because it's kind of like we're the center of the city. We're the hub of the city with all these different activities for people. They're, they're picking up on this. Everything is just growing, growing very fast for us. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we, try, we just keep trying to add more different stuff, and it kind of gets people's attention. So that's the way you do it. Yeah, it is. And that's <laughs> we we find some pretty cool stuff to do. So that's we're just running out of space to put it in. So yeah, we're hoping to expand. That's our next big project. Yes. Great. Um, our library board has stepped up and uh, got meetings together with some of the city council to to work on our addition. addition. That's great that you have that support from them too, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, just have, uh, um, we just have a couple of minutes for you, so I have a few more, uh, two more things here that people are asking about or mentioning, uh, talking about grants that are available. Someone is actually sharing that there's a new um, IMLS Institute of, for Museum and Library Services has a new grant. Um, they just now specifically for small libraries called Accelerating Promising Practices for Small Libraries. Um, uh, the special initiative of the National Leadership Grants for Libraries program to support projects that strengthen the ability of small and rural libraries and archives to serve their communities. Um, so that might be another grant for people to look into. Um, that is, yes. This is big IMLS street, something that is specifically focused for our small and rural libraries that we're talking about today. Awesome. Well, Thank that's you. good. Yeah. That's what we've been trying to do is... <laughs> Yeah. This is what yeah. we need to share is the information of grants and what's out there and available to all the small towns. Yes, yes. It's hard sometimes to find the ones that you can apply for, yeah. And well, and you want to make sure that what you get is legitimate. True. You know, because I worry about that when you search them online, whether or not they're, you know. Yeah, is it a real place? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, it kind of it, it kind of makes you wonder. There's a whole bunch of other stuff that you could look up that's not real online, and you know, so you kind of you know tread lightly on that stuff too. Because you don't usually get the full amount of money. You have to usually give like a 25 percent of your own funds into the grants. A match of yeah, a match. Yeah. Yes. So you want to make sure when when you're applying. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we have one other question. If anybody has any other last minute questions they want to get in for uh, Deborah and Mandy, um, go ahead and do it. We can we still have a couple of minutes here with them. Um, going back to accreditation, and this is really it could be a question for me. Um, for here in Nebraska, how does accreditation work if the library no longer has a library board? If the library has become part of the county? Um, here in Nebraska, in order to be accredited, you do have to have a board of some sort, but it can be a county library board. Um, here in Nebraska, in order to be a legally established public library, you have to have a board, but it doesn't have to be a local town board. It could be you are a county library, so there's a county board um, in some way that is um, designated to run the library. 
But if there's no board at all and some other group is running it, then they wouldn't really be legally established anymore. So wouldn't be eligible to do many of the things that we um, do here. That's just here in Nebraska. All right. Any other last minute questions from Andy and Deborah before we wrap up their, their session? Any other last words uh, from you guys? It was very good thing to take the classes. They really helped us to grow and to understand things better. So if I can do it, anybody can do it. <laughs> yeah, it's really not that hard. It's, no. you know, it's on the computer. All you got to do is it takes a few hours a week. Sit down and get them done. So and even if you get flustered with one class, if you get a hold of, you know, whoever's in charge of that class, they can help you out with it or it's. Yeah, and we learned a lot from those classes, even if you don't get accredited. Taking those classes would be a huge help because we yes. learned a lot of things that we didn't realize before. So, yes. and it's helped out with our accreditation. That's the idea. Hopefully it all, it all works together. Yeah. It did. Yeah. Great. All right. Great. Well, thank you very much, Mandy and Deborah. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.